All right. Hello, everybody. It's the Meister from Brews and Tunes. Cheers. I am uh, thrilled, absolutely thrilled tonight. I am chatting with the multi-talented uh, Baron Miseraka of uh, multiple bands, including um, Carnivore AD, uh, Vasaria, um, Motorplasm, or Plasma, sorry. Plasma. Uh, and and uh, yeah, Desecration, or Desecrator, a uh, bunch well, of that's great That's going bands. back a while. Yeah, way back. Um, so uh, thank you, Baron, so much for joining me tonight. I'm, I'm thrilled to be chatting with you. My pleasure, Victor. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Excellent. How are you doing? How are, how are things going? I'm pretty good. Keeping busy. Yeah. You know, long story short, you know, like we just talked about recovering from the snow apocalypse that, uh, that hit uh, the New York area. Um, I guess that's old news. And, uh, you know, just trying to, trying to get things back out there again, you know, dealing with the COVID situation that's, right. uh, you know, been uh, at the forefront of everything. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we just had a, a couple of dates that were canceled um, in Europe that was for next week. So we're kind of getting over that and, uh, and, and regrouping uh, and plotting our next move there and getting ready for the reschedule. Okay. But, um, you know, we're, uh, we're always open. We're always working and we always, uh, we always want to move ahead and we want to get out there and, and, and do what we do. Yeah. It's, yes. uh, that's what we live for. So yeah. and you're like, geez, like one of the busiest guys in rock and roll. I swear. It seems like you've always got stuff going on, um, whether it's well, music or, or otherwise. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll do anything to, I'm just trying to avoid getting a regular job. So I'll do anything <laughs> to avoid that. <laughs> there you go. But, uh, no, you know, I mean, life is all about, uh, pursuing your passions. Right. Right. So that that's pretty much, uh, what I'm doing. We're on this planet for a short period of time. So I want to, uh, I want to get all this out of my system. Um, I'm, I'm being, I'm very inspired and uh, I want to act upon the inspiration. Cool. It's, uh, right. it's as simple as that. You know? Nice. I Although love Carnivore it. ID is the main, uh, the main project. Okay. That's everything okay. else are just branches that uh, extend outward. Gotcha. Okay, so, cool. Record. Well, let's it. talk. Uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, definitely talk about, you know, Carnivore AD and kind of how that all came together. Um, you know, that legacy for one of, of Carnivore. Um, and how you got involved initially. And that was, I, I think you, you guys put the band together, what, around 2017 ish? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yep, exactly, 2017. Well, I mean, I guess the story goes way back uh, to the 1980s at places like CBGB's and then Lemoore. Um, I'm a former member of Sheer Terror. Chuck, as you know, is a former member of the Crumb Suckers. And our drummer, Joe Cangalosi, is a former member of Whiplash. And uh, we were all good friends, you know, with Pete and with Mark and Louie and also Keith Alexander, the first Carnivore guitar player. Oh, yeah. uh, all came out of the same scene, played shows together. Um, Pete loaned me his equipment. Uh, the stories go on and on and on. So, um, so we've been friends, you know, everybody in all these bands and the original Carnivore members since, uh, since those days. So we're definitely not, uh, we're definitely not strangers to uh, one another. We may all be very strange. Yes, but we're not strangers. <laughs> So, um, uh, fast forward to 2017, um, as you mentioned, uh, basically Mark, uh, Mark Piovanetti, um, the carnivore guitarist, second one, um, had, had resurfaced and he started to, uh, online and was playing, uh, bringing back a lot of the carnivore material, you know, playing it, um, by himself and then with some other musicians. Mm. And, uh, you know, I saw all this and I thought it was great. And, uh, I, I kept thinking to myself, Hmm. If I could just get in there, you know, I, I didn't want to be too obnoxious, which is rare for me because I'm usually very obnoxious. <laughs> but uh, then uh, an even more obnoxious mutual friend of ours um, in the music scene <laughs> um, suggested that I get a hold of Mark and uh, try to uh, put together some version of the band. Oh. You know, at, at first I thought my friend was completely insane, but then uh, the more I thought about it, uh, the more I liked the idea. And then. Uh, Long story short, one night in this very living room, I, I plugged in and I, uh, sang a f I sang and played a few excerpts of, uh, of a couple of the Carnivore songs, Male Supremacy and Race War. Oh, cool. Uh, to be precise, if memory serves me right. Um, I'm lucky I can make a lot of noise in this, in this house. Uh, you can imagine singing Race War atop your lungs. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I just put uh, some excerpts together and I sent them to Mark and I sent them to uh, Louis Beato, of course, the, uh, the original Carnivore drummer. And, um, and they liked what I sent them and had some uh, pretty encouraging things to say, especially Louie. And uh, I just popped the question. I'm like, why don't we get together and jam? Um, right. At first, because the scheduling and things that they were doing, um, it wasn't ready to happen. But then some, you know, some months later, uh, it was, long story short. Um, and actually prior to them 
being ready, I, I'd already started playing covers, um, some carnivore covers with some friends of mine. Oh, okay. Actually, our original drummer, Joe Branciforte, had uh, some years back initially suggested that we do a carnivore cover band. And I thought that was absurd. I'm like, oh, that's, that's crazy. That'll never get off the ground. But, uh, you know, after I contacted Bowie and Mark, I, was, I knew the songs were ready. And I'm like, all right, I got to play this. So I got back in touch with him. And then we did, uh, we did this as almost like a cover version, cover band version called Sex and Violence. And then, uh, you know, then Mark and Louie were ready to, uh, to play with me. And um, hence Carnival Ray D was born. Uh, cool. I'm giving you the condensed version. Uh, there's a lot of details. Uh, if I get too detail oriented, the sun will be coming up and I'll still be, I'll still be talking about this a couple of <laughs> that hours later. That's fascinating. But that was pretty much how it all began. Um, and again, we're all, we were all old friends, you know, from uh, the CBGBs and Lamore days. So, uh, you know, it felt very, very comfortable. And it was, uh, it was quite an honor to get in there and, and play with those guys and play this material that I, right. you know, that I've loved, you know, for all these, all these years. And uh, that, was, that was the birth of it, essentially. Um, we went on to do um, a show with uh, myself and the two original members um, at uh, Bowery Electric in New York City. And we also had the other drummer, Joe, uh, playing some songs as well. Hmm. So that was, uh, that was really something else. A very surreal experience for me to be playing. And I look to one side and there's Louie and then there's Mark on the other side. And I'm like, yeah. where's Pete? And I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. So, um, you know, very surreal experience. Uh, so that, that was definitely a blast. Um, eventually, due to, uh, you know, family and career obligations, the two original members um, haven't been able to participate. Uh, first Louie and then Mark uh, some time later. But, uh, but we carry on um, with their blessing and with their, uh, with the, with their endorsement, which right. means the world to us. And if that wasn't there, we couldn't be doing this. Um, so th that is pretty much uh, where we're at. Uh, after Mark wasn't able to, uh, uh, to continue um, for the, the reasons I mentioned, um, Chuck was the, the, the logical, uh, the first person that everybody thought of. Nice. Um, you know, I, I have a long history with Chuck uh, from the old days. Also, he was in, he is still in uh, my band, Basaria. Oh, that's and then right. um, Chuck and Mark played together in the past. Uh, Mark was in the Crumb Suckers after Carnivore had broken up. And then him and Chuck had another band um, years later. So it all seemed to make sense. Um, yeah. And then eventually uh, our first drummer had to, uh, uh, had to move on, you know, for personal reasons. And uh uh, we had a recommendation from another old friend of ours, um, Christian from Creator, a.k.a. Specie. Um, he had recommended Joe Cangalosi, who was in Creator for a little while. Right. This drummer that I mentioned that was also in Whiplash back then. So we, we all knew each other back then, but then, you know, it took him, him a while for now to get into the picture. All right. So uh, it was a great recommendation. Uh, Joe came down, and it, and it seemed to work instantly. Um, you know, he's... Uh, He's got carnivore running through his bloodstream the same way that I do and the same way that Chuck does. So it all just seemed to click and make sense. Yeah. So once again, you know, we're old friends from the same music scene as the original band. Um, you know, we, we're very qualified to do this. Right, <laughs> yeah. I love this music um, for all these years. And it's actually funny. If you look at the back of um, the Retaliation album, the second carnivore record, in the thank yous, they – they thank Sheer Terror, my band, Crump Suckers, Chuck's band, and Whiplash, oh, um, Joe's band, almost like within the same line of each other. Oh, that's so, wild. So it's like it came full circle. <laughs> it seems like it has, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, great. So, I mean, this isn't like we're just like a, just like some cover band or whatever. You right. Know? I mean, this, we were there. You know, these were friends of ours. Um, we had shared the stage together before. We thanked each other on each other's records, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, right. um, you know, it, it's a labor of love as it was from the beginning. Um, even more so with this lineup now, because not everybody was there at the same time. Right. So uh, it's a very special thing. You yeah. Know? So it, it's very personal. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, living on the West Coast, I haven't seen you guys live, but I've seen footage of of you playing live, and it's incredible. It's yeah, cool. and Thank I you. think you really capture the the essence and the spirit of the original band um, in that original sound, which is great. Yeah. Thanks. I really appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah. and, and as I say, we were there. Yeah. You know, we were sitting on the stage while they were playing. All right. You know, Joe Cangalosi was like right behind Louis' drum kit. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I, Pete loaned me his equipment one time. We were, so we were all there. Yeah. You know, right when it was happening and really close to it. And as I said, shared the stage and shared billing, et cetera. So, uh, so I, I think we're bringing that. What you're hearing is, is that. 
the fact that we were there. We didn't find out about this after the fact, you know, right, we were right there. So, uh, and we just loved the music and, and, you know, Pete was an old friend and, and we miss him. Yeah. And you know, we think about him all the time and, uh, Louis and Mark are good for old friends. So uh, again, it, it's a very, very personal thing. Yeah. And, uh, very cool. you know, and what you're saying means a lot. And, uh, and the fact that we can even, you know, continue on without, without those guys and have their, uh, their endorsement and their trust, yeah, that's... um, means the world to us. So that, that's what this is. It's just a labor of love. And, uh, you know, we just love this music and this music should always be heard. Yeah. Even if we weren't doing this, you should always be able to walk into a, a nightclub somewhere in the world and hear, you know, Predator or Race War or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, oh, the yeah. music should always be, it should never be forgotten ever. No. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that it, that it won't be. I love so, it. I think that's great. Has, has there been any consideration of, of the current lineup recording anything or even just a, a live album? Have you guys talked about that at all? Um, well, because of, you know, copyright and legal issues, we wouldn't be able to record anything and put it out. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've, re re we've recorded some demos. We did a recording of Ground Zero of Brooklyn hmm. um, not that long ago. Um, so we've done some recordings, but uh, nothing could be sold uh, commercially or anything like that. Gotcha. But, uh, but it's something that, that we have done. We'll probably be recording a few more once uh, schedule um, permits, just for ourselves and for people to hear, maybe get some airplay or, or something like that. Yeah, cool. But I do believe, I mean, if you want to hear Carnivore, get those records. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Period. You know what I'm saying? So that would be my recommendation. Right. Yeah. But that's... if you want to hear us, that, us do it, that's cool too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It's almost like Carnivore ID is more about the live performance because that, that can never be replicated again, obviously. Yeah. You know, without, without Pete being here, without the band being, um, you know, functioning. You know, but the records live on, you know, so. Um, Pete will always be with us and Keith Alexander if you put those records on. So, yeah. um, so that, that, that'll always stay there, but uh, the live performance won't. And now that's where we come in. Yeah. And I believe that, I believe the second album was just recently re-released, remastered, re-released through, I don't remember which record company, but I, I know I saw something recently where it, it was available. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's been re uh, remastered a few times, the first album as well. Yeah. yeah. Interestingly enough with some different artwork, um, You'd have to get a hold of the people at the uh, the original label at Roadrunner, right? Yeah, uh, you know they would be, uh, you know, more uh, qualified to give you the full uh, scoop on that. Yeah, but um, you know, yeah. So it's it's good that it's being remastered and reissued as well. So um, for the sake of getting it out there uh, to the public, um, of course, I still have my vinyl. Um, oh yeah, hey, <laughs> nice. Of course, yeah. That's, yeah. What a yeah. what great stuff, man. It's... Yeah, yeah. Great memories. Just you know, yeah. being around in those days and hearing this stuff for the first time and getting these records, uh, it, it really deeply impacted all of us. Uh, right. I speak on behalf of the other two guys in the band as well. Nice. Um, we've never recovered from it. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, the, we never will. And what, one thing that I I I've always found I find fascinating about you as a musician is you have. You know, I mean, along with Carnivore ID, you've got your fingers in a lot of different things and in different genres too. You, you, you're, um, you know, it seems like, you know, I mean, you do a lounge thing, you do a lounge act, which is amazing. And then also, I, and I think it's a newer, newer band, your, your, um, uh, Motor Plasma, which sounds fantastic. I mean, I, and I haven't heard it. I've just read about, uh, and so you're doing Motorhead covers and Plasmatic covers. Yes. Uh, which is just such a cool idea anyway. Um, yeah, no, thank you. You know, it's a, it's a pretty demented idea, I guess, in, in, uh, in some respects. Um, that basically was a crazy idea that came about during lockdown. Oh, okay. That was, that was like a, a cure for lockdown depression. <laughs> <laughs> First, just listening to the old Motorhead vinyl and the old Plasmatics vinyl. Um, that, you know, that made me feel a little bit more oriented. <laughs> All right. You know, when this whole insanity began. Uh, and then I took it to the next level, you know, as far as getting, uh, you know, two old friends of mine um, uh, to play in the band, uh, Mark Desiello, the drummer, and um, Evan Stramar, uh, guitarist and keyboard player, who's also responsible for a lot of the footage that you've seen of Carnivore AD and, uh, and oh, okay. Plasma as well. So uh, he's doing a lot of, uh, does a lot of great things. So yeah, that, that instantly clicked. Um, I love the Plasmatics as much as I love Carnivore, and that's saying a lot. And of course, Motorhead is, you know, one of the greatest rock bands of all time at this point. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's been a blast. And some people ask, well, why, what's the connection between the two bands? Um, maybe you remember. Do you? Now I'm asking you the question. Oh, um, you know, I, I know 
Wendy O. Williams and, and Lemmy were friends at one point. I knew they hung out, but I, I, I'm sure there's something else there that I'm Yeah, yeah, even more so. They, um, they, they played on each other's, each other's records. Oh, okay. And did a duet, um, Lemmy and Wendy did a duet of uh, Stand By Your Man, the, the country version oh, song. Oh, that's right. Tammy I forgot about yeah. that. And then uh, on the Plasmatics, one of the Plasmatics records, they record No Class, the Motorhead song. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then Wendy did Jailbait live with her solo band. Right, and yeah. uh, and the flip side of the "Stand by Your Man" duet had uh, Lemmy singing uh, "Master Plan," which is a oh. cosmetic song, and then another version of Wendy doing uh, "No Class." Oh, cool! So, uh, and it featured two of the Plasmatics guys on guitar, and then Wendy and uh, I mean uh, Lemmy and Phil Taylor, uh, you know, in the rhythm section, and the two you know swapping vocals. Nice. So, so it was that moment in time that uh, kind of uh, in inspired Motor Plasma. That and being cool. locked up uh, in the house during lockdown. So, um, you know, so that was the deal with that. Nice. Um, I actually happen to be also friends, old friends with the Plasmatics members, and they've given their blessing and oh, cool. said positive things about it. So uh, I think they gave their blessing, but they said some pretty, uh, pretty encouraging things about what we were doing, uh, which was great. Yeah. So, um, so there is some lineage, you know, back to the Plasmatics with Motor Plasma. Um, so uh, that means a lot, you know. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah, so that's, that's definitely a side project, a glorified side project. Um, and a very simple band to, to, to get off the ground. Everybody lives close by, um, studios close by, as, as opposed to in, uh, in Carnivore. I don't know if, as you know, Chuck is in a, you know, was far away from us. And uh, okay. yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit of a challenge. But uh, Motoplast was like an easy no brainer, um, all just for fun. So, uh, so it's out there. Another labor of love. <laughs> cool. And yeah, in fact, you guys just played live recently, correct? Just um, yeah, yeah. We did a show on in Connecticut recently, which was great. Um, oh, okay. It's a new project. We've only done about four shows so far. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's something else uh, to have there. You know, again, I'm just, uh, I'm in love with the plasmatics. I'm in love with carnivore. I just got to, yeah. I just got to do it. Yes. <laughs> That's great. I love it. I think, I think it's a brilliant idea. I think it's fantastic. Well, thanks. I appreciate you saying that. I would love, I need to get out to New York and see you guys play live. I, I would yeah, love yeah, we'll keep you that. posted. We're starting to branch out a little bit now with Moto Plasma. So uh, oh, okay. anything is possible. We'll, we'll see where it all goes. Nice. But uh, maybe you saw some of the, uh, the video footage that we had online as well. Yeah, I saw, I saw a little bit. Yeah, I need, to, I need to explore a little more and see what else okay. is out there. Very cool. Yeah. We, we uh, did one video um, where I actually got to smash a television set the way Wendy did. Oh, I yeah. never realized how much fun that was. It was, <laughs> was glorious. You know, I bought a nice sledgehammer and uh, uh, Mark, the, the drummer in uh, Motor Plus, was able to get like a vintage 1980s TV from a coworker. Um, I remember saying to him, joking around, I'm like, oh, can you get me a TV to smash? <laughs> the next day, he's like, oh, yeah, I got one. It's from the 80s for my work. I'm like, all right, perfect. So then it all came together. But uh, yeah, smashing a television set with a sledgehammer. I recommend that to everybody out there. Um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, way to spend an afternoon. Of course, you got to do it in a safe setting. Right. You know, yeah. Everything has to be controlled, which is the way we did it. You know, it wasn't in a house or anything like that. Right. So, uh, it's got to be done the right way. So, yeah. So you don't like injure yourself or others. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, nice. you know, that's great. I guess um, I to avoid a regular job. So. Right. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, why don't you take me back? Let's go way back. Like, when did you originally get started in music? What was, did you come from a musical family? What, what inspired you to start playing music? Um, not really a musical family too much. Although on my mother's side, there was some, uh, a musician or two, I think a music teacher. Um, that wasn't so much the inspiration, uh, just loving music. I guess that's a reason a lot of people get into it. Um, I just fell in love with it, especially, uh, you know, the hardcore and punk stuff and, and, uh, and the hardcore scene in general. And uh, originally I started out as a drummer oh, okay. as a kid, but um, I grew up in a residential area in Brooklyn. And uh, needless to say, the neighbors weren't too happy with my learning how to play <laughs> drums. You know, I'm on the third floor. So um, I eventually got a bass, you know, it has a volume control on it. So uh, the neighbors were much more happy with that. And that seemed to be my true calling anyway. Right. And um, I was learning how to play. And then six months into it, I remember putting a small ad in uh, the music store where I was taking lessons uh, from in Brooklyn, saying something like, uh, bass player into Venom and Merciful, hardcore slash Venom and Merciful Fade influenced bass player, or something like that, looking for a hardcore metal band or something. And then I got a, a phone call from uh, the one and only Alan Blake from uh, the original Sheer Terror lineup. Cool. And uh, yeah, and we met up and uh, everything clicked. 
and sheer terror was born essentially wow um that was the the start of sheer terror uh yeah it, it all pretty much came out of that initially blake and the and the drummer uh sam loman aka reed they came from another band called no control from the hardcore scene and uh blake had the idea that he wanted to just kind of expand and get more of like a celtic frost metal kind of influence into what he was doing hmm. and that's exactly what we did and, and uh i was a part of bringing that influence in there cool. and then we mixed that in with the whole hardcore uh premise and energy and that's uh that's where sheer terror came from nice and then of course you're... eventually we got paul bearer and uh you know the world hasn't been the same since all right and you were just kids days. that's what's so crazy you were just kids <laughs> yeah no we were it's ridiculous yeah i mean i didn't even know why blake wanted to play with us to be honest <laughs> he had already been around for a while and Paul and I were like these rotten, like 17 year olds. Wow. You know, so him and I often wonder, I'm like, why the hell would he want to play with us? Especially both of us. You know, you would think one would be bad enough, but then have the two <laughs> of us together. But, uh, but that was, that was what he wanted to do. Um, I think he felt because we, we were moldable. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he did say that to me. It's like, oh, well, you, you guys were moldable. That's why. right. Yeah, that makes so, sense. Um, <laughs> but it all worked. You know, we definitely yeah. did something really, really cool at the time. Uh, you know, that, that's when the crossover thing was, was just starting to happen. We're talking about 1984 here, essentially. Yeah. So, uh, again, we took the Celtic Frost influence and all that and put it into New York hardcore 1984-style music. Wow. And, uh, and that's what Sheer Terror was. And as that's how as, I got started. That, that was my, uh, the beginning. Nice. Okay. As far as your base work at that time, and maybe, and maybe it's changed, um, who were your big influences at that time? Well, let's see. Um, I guess a lot of the obvious ones. Um, Geezer Butler, everyone's going to mm -hmm. like. Uh, even though, you know, nobody's going to be as great as Geezer Butler ever was. But uh, definitely an influence. Um, Motorhead, Lemmy, of course. Yeah. Um, that, that started it all in terms of the distortion and all that. Uh, you know, it all came from that. Um, I always like Kronos a lot. I don't know. Uh, from Phenom. You know, he might have been a little all over the place at times. But, <laughs> right. uh, but there was something really solid and, and uh, intense uh, happening there. Um, another bass player I like a lot is uh, Chris Romanelli from uh, from the Plasmatics, the last bass player oh, okay. that they had when they were in a more of a metal direction. Um, I think a lot of what he uh, did was uh, was really cool. Yeah, he definitely uh, influenced me, uh, which was great. He actually recently contacted us um, in regards to a video that we just posted, which I thought was great. It was a song that he had written. Oh, nice! It had like a bass break in it, and uh, he said that he liked it, so that made my day a few days ago. Oh, that's um, great. So, uh, yeah, those are some of the main influences. I'm trying to think who I might have left out. Uh, I always liked Gene Simmons a lot as a kid. Oh, yeah. You know, we all, we all came from Kiss, I think. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. guessing you did as well. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I remember, and this is absurd, but I remember, I didn't really, I didn't throw a tantrum, but I remember being very upset that I was at a mall. This would have been about probably 77, 78. And there was a kiosk and a guy was selling t-shirts, uh, I think destroyer t-shirts. And I wanted one. And my mom's like, no, no, I'm not buying you a t-shirt. And I was pissed. <laughs> furious. Uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, early age. Yeah, I was. Well, I'm sure you got a lot more shirts after that. Yeah, yeah. And I finally did get a destroyer t-shirt. I think when I was 20 something, but, right. you know, well, finally found one. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Kiss was always a huge influence for me. I mean, yeah, yeah, from a very young age. Oh yeah, same here. That's where it all began. Yeah, absolutely. Even before I even had any interest in, in music per se. Yeah, I think my, my interest. I was first drawn to Kiss because of my interest in comic books and horror films. Yeah, me obviously. Too. Then you see that, and it's like, all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was the beginning. And before that, there was uh, nothing in terms of uh, in terms of music. Yeah, no, I, I totally, I'm right there with you. Yeah, was, yeah, like you said, yeah, comic books and horror films. Yeah, when you see Kiss, that first time as a child, you're like, it's a monster movie and superheroes on stage with guitars. Like, yeah, this yeah, is the absolutely. coolest thing ever. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, so, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, great memories. I'm, I'm sure you have it plenty as well. Yeah. You know, with the first time you saw them. Uh, yeah. I have great memories as well. Uh, yeah, really something special. So uh, we're very fortunate that we were there. Yeah. Right, you and I with Kiss, and then with the hardcore stuff and everything. So, uh, I'm well, I would, uh, I would imagine. I mean, yeah, in the '80s, the mid mid '80s, early '80s, mid '80s. You know, growing up in in Brooklyn, you know, with you know CBGBs and and all those cool clubs in New York, and and yeah, just this thriving underground scene. It must have Absolutely. been incredible. Yeah, you felt it in the air. There was something going on, and you wanted to be there. 
yeah it was crucial that you got there you know what i mean and it was stuff happening all the time you had the uh, the hardcore matinees on sunday at cbgb's and then lamores had you know metallica playing on, on a friday oh. or a saturday etc cetera, etc cetera. so there was always something happening three four nights in a row at times and it was all being done for the first time and it was all yeah. fresh you know right the lightning had just come out you know the first slayer record had just come out uh you know, metal and, and hardcore were starting to cross over and you just couldn't believe it. So it was, uh, there was a real sense of urgency that you didn't want to miss anything. Right. You know? Did you have a, and, I'm sorry. I was going to say, did you have a, you know, at that the young age of 17, when you were in sure terror, did you have a sense that you were part of something big? Did it feel like, wow, there's a revolution going on and musically right now? Well, it, it definitely felt like there was a revolution going on and something very creative and something that I felt that I belonged in. Mm. I was having a hard time fitting myself into things before and, and I, I wasn't sure where I, where I belonged. So that definitely, I remember after the first time I played with Sheratar, I was like, all right, this is where I belong, totally. Um, so yeah, we definitely felt there was something happening, something going on in the air, but I don't think any of us felt that it would be all this time later and we'd still be talking about it though. Right. Well, you know, that it would be 35 years later, et cetera. Yeah. And that we'd, it would still be just even more relevant than it ever was. So that, that comes as a present surprise. Also, I think when, when you're that age, when you're young, you're not thinking too much really about anything, I don't think. Yeah. You're, you're kind of in the moment right. and you realize something great is happening, but you're not really following it too far into the future, you know? So, um, yeah, but we all felt it. I mean, uh, and I speak for myself and, and, and Chuck and Joe as well. Um, in the bands that they were in as well, obviously. Right. So, yeah, there was something happening. There's no question about it. And we were very grateful to be a part of it. Nice. And that's where we belonged. So, uh, you know, I mean, initially the idea of the hardcore scene was just like the misfits that didn't fit anywhere. Or the freaks, you know what I mean? But we all fit here and it all seemed to work. So, you know, it was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, you know, the world is, is a completely different planet right now. Right. Yeah. You know, so... Uh, we've never seen anything like that since and probably we'll never see anything like that never saw anything like that before either right um but uh you know that that's another big part of what what carnivore d is all about as well it's also a tribute to all these things that we're talking about here as well you know just that whole scene and being there and what was happening you know we're trying to uh we're trying to bring back some of the magic and the energy that we had experienced cool you know i, I always say it's here for um for the people that were there and wanted more or the people that weren't there I wish that they were, you know, we're hoping that if you, if you come see the band play, you'll kind of get a little bit of a, of a taste of how it was, Yeah. you know? So, um, you know, it's, uh, that, that's all part of, uh, what this is all about here. So cool. it's a real, uh, it's a real, it's, it, it's a travel back into time. It's almost like we're time travelers in a way, just to go back to where we were and just to take that, five of that energy and then bring it back here it's like all right here it is you know right yeah so i love it yeah maybe i'm getting a little carried away with this but no no it's 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 a it's a very good thing it's a very good thing um so you mentioned horror and comics so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your horror comic book um which is in the flesh and spirit uh which is so cool thank you um you know, as a kid, before the Kiss days, I was a big comic book collector. Um, I still have all my comics here in the basement downstairs there. Um, I, I was obsessed uh, with comics and horror films at a very a very early age. So it, ultimately, it came time where I felt like I wanted to be in a comic book. Hmm. It was just something I had to do. <laughs> nice. So, um, so it, initially, In Flesh and Spirit was done actually some years, um, you know, some years in the past there. Oh, okay. Um, it was almost like a one-off that I pretty much did on my own. And then, um, and then it was pretty much, I, I thought it was done and out of my system and buried. But then once again, during the COVID lockdown, I heard from uh, an old online friend of mine, um, Chris McCauley, who ended up doing the, the colorization um, in the book. Oh, okay. He just contacted me and he's like, oh, how would you like if I colorize the comic book? And I'm like, oh, sure. You know? and, then, um, and then he did. And then we managed to get a publisher to put it out. And uh, now we recently signed like a new publishing deal, which I was pretty excited about. Chris, um, my, my good friend Chris McCauley also works with uh, the Stokerverse, which is um, a, a company uh, run by him and uh, Dacre Stoker, who is the great grand nephew of Bram Stoker. The, oh, wow. Uh, yes, the author of uh, the original Dracula, obviously in the late 1880s. Um, 
So, so now in flesh and spirit is in conjunction with the Stokerverse, you know, with the, the Bram Stoker descendant. That's and we have cool. a new publisher, Hellbound Books. So we're, uh, we're putting out like an extended version of the comic now, which will also consist of like um, a few other short comic stories and cool. uh, a lot of short stories written by a Chris. In addition to the great colorization, he's also a great writer. So, uh, and some other surprises as well. So we're, we're putting this out in, into a more extended version. Cool. Um, that's coming in the spring as well. So we're, uh, we're getting a lot of mileage from issue number one here, but, uh, and then, and then hopefully after that, we'll go on to the, uh, you know, to the following issues, which there are stories already outlined and even artwork um, for the cover of issue two, which is being worked on right now by a great artist named uh, Ash Corvita based out of Germany. Um, oh, cool. She's coming up with something uh, really intense. I'm very excited right. about that. Um, funny story about her. We had gotten her into the picture when we put it out recently before this new publisher. Um, but there, there's some nudity in the book, some female f nudity, um, artistic nudity. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but there was an issue and the publisher felt that uh, if that stayed and then the book would be like a mature audience kind of a thing and would only uh -huh. be available in a brown wrapper in the back of the store. Uh -huh. So there was a request to kind of cover up all the, the lady parts. And that's where this artist came in and she went in there and drew wonderful pieces of clothing and, and covered everything up. So uh, that, that was her in interest. I mean, her uh, introduction into the, uh, the artist dream team here. Okay. Um, so, but she'll be doing the, saying all that to say, she'll be doing the cover for issue number two. So we're excited about that as well. But first, as I said, we do have the reissue of issue number one in an extended format with all these extra bonuses on the new publisher, Hellbound Books. I said that all, but I'll take it a breath. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is exciting. That's really cool. And I'll, um, I'll include uh just so everybody watching this, I'll, there'll be links in the description below um, okay. for the bands as well as to check out the comic book. Um, cool, yeah, yeah. yeah which, is, which is very cool and exciting stuff. And awesome. I mean, Thank you know, you. I mean, it's you know, a real labor of love. Yeah, I mean, vampires, comic books, what more could you want? That's yeah, that's yeah. that's well, great stuff. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, such a cool, right oh, that's so great. That yeah. art is amazing. And speaking of cover, um, mention has to be, uh, that's to be mentioned made about the cover artist. Uh, another old, a great friend of mine, Alex Horley, oh, um, is the artist that, if you're familiar with him, he's the artist that uh, did that wonderful painting. Yeah. Um, Alex's resume goes on and on and on. DC Comics, Vampirella. That could be a whole other show you could do, just everything yeah. that Alex did. So, um, yeah, so much love and, and appreciation to Alex um, and to everybody in this art uh, artist dream nightmare team that I had, including uh, the interior artist, uh, David G. Williams. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal artist. He's ba based out of Australia. So there was a lot of great talent involved in this and everybody did this for, you know, donated their time or did it for peanuts, essentially. I wish I could pay everybody what they're worth, but uh, unfortunately I can't. <laughs> so um, yeah, all these guys, their involvement in, in this project means, uh, means the world to me. Nice. So um, yeah, I, I can't thank everybody enough. There's plenty of them out there. So uh, great people who I admire and respect and I'm very lucky to have them uh, you know, be, be involved in this, uh, in, in this journey. So uh, well, that's great. Everything develops. So thank you for asking about that. Yeah. That's so cool. That's, that's like really exciting news. Yeah. I, I yeah. need to get my hands on that once it's, uh, once it's published and you were saying in the spring, you're thinking so, so fairly um, soon. Yeah, yeah. The extended version should be out in the spring. Um, we still have some of the, the regular comic book, uh, versions of it. You can send me your, uh, let me know your address and I'll send you a copy. Oh, cool. Yeah. That I just held up. Yeah. Yeah. So I know it's hard to keep up with the different publishers and the different issuings here and there, but uh, I get confused myself sometimes. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I'll send you out a copy. And uh, oh, thank you. I would love to. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. There. No, I was saying the book ties into the music and the music scene. It takes place in uh, in Coney Island, uh, New York. The story is uh, my character is a uh, was initially um, a musician from uh, from the Middle Ages hmm. that was ultimately uh, condemned by the church. Um, and then long story short, he's uh, reborn in contemporary New York City in uh, the Coney Island area. Oh, so, uh, you know, anyone that's been to Coney Island and New York City in general, that's a good uh, background for a horror story. Yeah. So, uh, you know, right. anything can happen there, and it often does. So uh, <laughs> might as well have a, a 14th century vampire reborn in the midst of it. Um, and that's the basic gist of that. Cool. So, uh, you know, it all comes from the same place as the music. Yeah. Let's put it that way. So. I love and it. As you know, a lot of people that are into metal and hardcore are heavily into comics and uh, oh yeah, horror films as well. So uh, 
but all ties in it complements uh it complements each other nice very cool um let's talk about uh your other band uh basaria um and kind of and that's been a long running band you started that in the mid 90 late 90s i think yeah right? yeah exactly um that goes back to the late 90s um with uh of course chuck uh, on guitar yes. um we did a, de a debut album that was uh put on century media records a lot of people know um and then after that we just did uh you know recordings on our own essentially um the whole thing was uh, uh came to life out of a demo project that we had done prior um, myself with Chuck on guitar and also with Evans Trumar, the guitarist uh, in Motor Plasma. He uh, uh, did a lot of keyboard tracks back then. Oh, okay. He's a uh, you know, dual instrumentalist there. So, um, yeah, so it's been on and off throughout the years. I mean, I did put the band on ice, as they say, for a while. Um, and then we recently kind of resurrected it and it's on ice again and it's resurrected again. So um, the idea was to take it into a heavier direction as well. Oh, okay. to kind of bring some of the carnivore influence and all the more current influences in there. Um, right now, we are focusing more on the other things, but uh, we, we shall be back with that. Okay. Um, you know, it's like the monster in the horror films. It'll die, but then it'll be back again. <laughs> you know? So but that's kind of uh, the situation with this area. Gotcha. Um, that was always more on like a goth uh, metal yeah. kind, of, uh, kind of a direction, um, which, like I said, now it'll be in a heavy direction now as well. Um, so more on that as it develops. Uh, thank you for asking about that. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, I was curious because I had, I remember hearing some stuff years ago, but I hadn't heard anything for a while, so I wasn't really sure if it was still a thing or, yeah, like you said, kind of on ice for a bit. Um, uh, yeah, still yeah, on ice slash still a thing, somewhere in between the two. We did put together a few demos um, a, a couple years back. Okay, uh, so it was complete, and there was a Bandcamp uh, page. Um, as well for this area that features the demo stuff that we had done, um, you know, two years ago. Uh, myself, Chuck, um, the original drummer who played on the uh, the album, Scott Harris, okay. and uh, Evan Schumar on, on keyboards and rhythm guitar. That's the okay. lineup for the, the demos that are out there on Bandcamp. Um, we can include a link um, if people are interested in checking it out. Yeah, yeah. So, I'll uh, check that out. Yeah, but uh, you know, right now I guess the focus is still is, is Carnivore D essentially. Cool. But. Um, but all in due time. We hope to get all this rolling and, and, and out there. Uh, definitely all in due time. Nice. So uh, more and everything as it develops, you know? Very cool. Um, yeah, so obviously you have a lot of irons in the fire. Um, and then another thing I was curious about, you know, speaking of irons in the fire, is you've even done some dabbling in acting and directing, correct? Um, not so much directing, but uh, definitely acting. Okay. Uh, some some B-movie films. Uh, sure, absolutely. Do you still intend, do you have plans to do any more of that work at all? Um, yeah, no, I would love to. Yeah, nice. absolutely. So any, any, uh, casting directors out there, uh, you know, give me a call, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, the independent cinema, I mean, it's rough. Everything's done on a, on a shoestring budget. True. So, true. uh, you know, a lot of stuff is self-distributed, so, uh, it could be quite a challenge, you know, as if being in the music business wasn't, uh, enough of a challenge enough, then you go right. and do, uh. Yeah. tap into independent cinema oh well, maybe um, someday that we'll see a in the flesh and spirit live action film starring baron <laughs> yeah that's something that we've talked about oh um, yeah maybe yeah, some sort of a cool. video game actually oh wow um yeah yeah the uh the people that i'm working with that i mentioned um definitely have uh do a lot of work in, in gaming and things like that nice so that is something that's being discussed here we're hoping we could uh you know introduce this as like the new wave of, of vampire stories you know, obviously, with the Bram Stoker stuff was where it all began. Yeah. Um, a, a big part of their focus is not so much, you know, on the old classics, but almost like to bring that vibe into the future now. Okay. You know, so that's kind of where where I come in, or at least to some extent. Um, uh, uh, my, Mr. Stoker Daker um, refers to me as the Baron of the Stokerverse, so that's <laughs> quite a that's quite a title. So I hope I can live up to that. Um, <laughs> so you know, yeah, this, we're just all a bunch of really inspired and. Uh, half crazed people and uh this is what we all do all my, all my musician and artist people here uh this is where we're at yeah so, it's great uh, i yeah. love it that's good stuff that's good it's, stuff. it's never a dull moment let's no it. no so, uh, that is actually awesome. on the subject of, of horror cinema maybe you saw something else that i'm that i just started doing my latest crazy idea is that i'm going to be uh, uh hosting and presenting a lot of the horror classics starting off with uh nosferatu 
Oh, cool. Yeah, I did see something about that. I will. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my latest cockamamie idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is basically the 100th anniversary of uh, the release of Nosferatu. Oh, yeah. So I think that that's quite a that's quite a milestone. Yeah. Especially for our culture, you know, um, you know. So um, I just got the idea of uh, why don't I, you know, present this or host it? That's something else I always wanted to do, um, to be like a host of, of horror films, kind of like a kind of like what Elvira does or Vampira. Oh, yeah. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to look anything like the, her when she does it. You know what I mean? But, <laughs> right. Or even like Rod Serling in the old Twilight Zone uh, yeah. TV show, the way he would kind of introduce it and have a little bit of narrative. So it was something that I always wanted to do. And then I'm like, I heard about the Nosferatu thing. And I'm like, let me give it a shot. Um, and I already have a few things booked, which I'm excited about. Oh, cool. So, uh, yeah, the first screening will take place at um, uh, the Court of Lazarus uh, Vampire uh, Gathering on uh, March 20th, actually, okay. at a, a really nice venue in New York City called uh, Madame X. Hmm. Um, nice red and velvety uh, kind of place. Um, Perfect. I think they refer to themselves as the, the sexiest lounge in New York City. Okay. I think that's their, their, their phrase. So I'll be, I'll be presenting and uh, hosting uh, um, a screening of Nosferatu um, Very cool. at that place. And a, a couple other things um, coming up as well. So, uh, yeah, it was just something that I really wanted to do. So, uh, you that's know, 100 great. year anniversary, that, that's, that's pretty heavy. Yeah, that's, that's so, amazing. Yeah. yeah I, I didn't absolutely. realize it was at the 100 year mark. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. We're starting to hit sense. that mark now. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty sick. Yeah. Uh, you know, soon we'll be at the 100-year mark of Dracula and Frankenstein, 1931. Yeah, that's you know, right. Uh, 100-year mark is right around the corner. So, uh, you know, that's something else. You know, I think out of anything in our popular culture, in the metal and goth scene, that this is the first real serious milestone, 100 years of something. Yeah. So I think Nosferatu is the first one there. So, uh, yeah, and I, I've been a very big fan of... Uh, of, of the old classics, um, as I'm sure you are. And oh, most, yeah. Uh, yeah, and most people into this music are. Yeah, so, uh, I love, yeah, so, yeah, I love the, in fact, I need to, you know, Halloween, my wife and I, my stepson, we, we like to watch a lot of horror films the entire month of, of October. And Oh, yeah, right on, I same here. could not find my copy of Dracula. I think one of my kids has it, so I need to call them up and like, hey, where the hell is my <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely VHS? You know, it's old. I've had it for years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I still have some of the VHS also. Yeah, it's it's You're talking a... about the Lagosi nineteen thirty one. Yeah, yeah, Lagosi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. And I remember talking to my grandmother about it uh years ago. You know, she's passed been passed away for a while, but I think she was born in oh twenty five or somewhere around there, maybe maybe twenty two. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Um but she remembers seeing that film. Oh, I'm sure. The original yeah, yeah. Dracula, and it, she said it scared the hell out of her, which yeah. is funny now when you watch it now because it's, it's you know, apart from the the cinematography is still amazing. Yeah, um, but you Absolutely. know, it's you know, it's very 1930s acting. It's a little cheesy, but it's still just it's brilliant. It's a beautiful yeah. film. There's no question about it. Yeah, and I know what you mean. These days, audiences, you know, we're more prone to laugh at it, especially younger people. Yeah, but she's. But in those days, when those films came out, that was considered horrifying. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. She said it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Those were her exact words. I think she said it was horrifying. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, there was like health warnings. Uh, if anyone had, you know, really hard, <laughs> don't you know, we we'll warn you now. Yeah. Totally. Um, I was even reading uh, Nosferatu was actually banned in some countries in Europe. Oh, really? In 1922. Yeah, it, it's a German film. Um, but in some of the other countries, it was banned. They're like, no, we can't show this in this country. It's just terrible. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in those days, that blew everybody's mind. Yeah. Um, well, that makeup is, I mean, it's its way ahead of its time. The Nosferatu makeup. Yeah, yeah. It's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, all the makeups as well, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, so, Nosferatu yeah, especially. Insane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that they, yeah. yeah you Something out of a pictures. nightmare completely. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's horrifying looking. I mean, yeah, I mean, I remember seeing the film years ago, but I mean, just still pictures of him. It's like, wow, that's impressive you know yeah I mean, yeah it's like something it's very, you'd see today yeah it, it's very disturbing yeah Even by today's standards i think that I, that'll scare the shit out of you though yeah absolutely you know right yeah but... his uh nosferatu is kind of closer to what uh, bram stoker wrote in the novel yeah essentially you know was the, where the, where the vampire wasn't really like a suave kind of bill lugosi guy with a tuxedo yeah it was just like a disgusting horrible horrifying creature right so they did get a little bit close to that um, and it was Universal Pictures, obviously, that introduced, uh, you know, the Lugosi version, like the suave guy that you want, you want to invite him in, you know? Right, yeah. They, they, they really revolutionized uh, that tale. So, uh, 
yeah, it's a fascinating history behind all that stuff. Um, something I've always been into. Yeah. Um, and that I tend to ramble on a lot about. So I figured, let me do it on stage uh, before our film starts. <laughs> yeah, that's you know great. That's great. Well, it's so cool that you're the tie-in too now with your comic and that world with with Bram Stoker. I mean, with the Stoker verse. That's yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. Incredible. That's a tremendous, tremendous honor, and I, and I'm so grateful to those guys, um, you know, for believing in this. Um, and I couldn't have done it without Chris McCauley, like I said, uh, the guy that co-founded that with uh, with the Bram Stoker descendant, who did the colorization of my book. He was he's the guy that really got everything resurrected, and you know, he pulled it out of the coffin and you know, pull, pulled me out of the coffin in the book and colored it and, and got those people um, involved. So uh, it's really something else. Uh, and, and they're a great bunch of guys. It's really, uh, it's really cool. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, Bram Stoker is the Dracula with Black Sabbath is the heavy metal, right? Yeah. It's just, all right. it all came from there. And without that, there would be nothing. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's really tremendous. And uh, again, it's an honor and, and I'm very happy to, to call all these guys uh, my friends. So, uh you know, it's it's a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah, I'm very content great. creatively these days. Uh, yeah, sounds like it. Yeah, you got a lot of cool stuff going on. That is great. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, Baron, this has been fascinating. I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Sure, um, my pleasure. Yeah, so, and as, as, you know, as I mentioned earlier for the listeners, um, please read the description below. They'll You'll find links to, uh, you know, the comic book, to the various bands, Carnivore AD, um, the, yeah, uh, motor plasma. So check it out. Um, you will not be sorry. A lot of cool creative stuff happening. Um, so again, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure, Victor. All right. It was a blast. Awesome. We should do this every Saturday, you know? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs>